For the next few moments, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes as I walk you through an account, really a series of incidents that occurred in a non-disclosed location not all that long ago. Now, as I narrate, I'll ask you to allow your mind to fill in the blanks. And when we're done, I have a couple of questions for you. So let's begin. The time is 10, 15 hours. You're an intelligence specialist monitoring your terminal at operations command. Behind you, your commanding officer sips her morning coffee. An alert pops up on your dashboard from a trusted intel source that a persistent threat actor initiated a disinformation campaign outside the sector your unit's assigned to. It's now 10, 16 hours. You quickly share the details with another specialist and you both start searching your sector for the indicators of compromise listed in the alert. 10, 20 hours. With no indications of regional attacks, your attention jumps to another ping on your dashboard. This time, a physical threat that's less than a mile from one of your forward positions. An alpha team was scheduled to arrive there to set up at 0730. You saw their, com their comms come online at 0758, a few minutes ahead of schedule, so you know they're good to go. At 1021, you make initial contact with alpha team leader and share the threat details. By 1022, he deploys a scout to gather additional intelligence in the direction of the threat. A few tense minutes pass and at 1025 hours, you receive communication from an operational partner that while a team has been dispatched to mitigate the threat, one course of action is the evacuation of your forward position. This isn't ideal, but it's why we have contingency plans. Based on this intel, Bravo teams put on alert and prepares to deploy, deploy established countermeasures. It's now 1030 hours. In the minutes that follow, not only will the threat be eliminated, but your team's position will remain undisturbed all because of your quick response. It's 10.35 hours, situation all clear, Bravo team stands down. 20 minutes have passed and it's time to get back to chasing down whether that cyber threat is Panda or Bear in origin. Open your eyes. Well, welcome back. How many of you can tell me where you were? Were you overseas? What was the environment like? Who or what were you protecting and what was the threat? Were you in uniform or on a special assignment? Would you be upset if I told you that what was being protected was an election? That the intent was to demonstrate some of the parallels between elections and a military operating environment. My name's Chad Houck and I'm Idaho's Chief Deputy Secretary of State. The incidents and timeline I just described to you were completely real. They happened on November 3rd, 2020 during the presidential election. And they're why I'm here to talk to you today about the lessons that our office has learned specifically from military special operations on the value of real-time situational intelligence applied in elections administration. In the few minutes we have together and before I let you in on the full details of the events I just described, I'd like to share with you a few points on the challenges that obscure situational visibility, the necessity for situational overwatch in complex environments, the successes we had in our November prototype and some plans we have for the future. But first, let's look at the challenges. And as we do, even though I'll be walking you through this in the lens of an election, I want you to consider how this may parallel your aspect of Homeland Security, regardless of what it may be. Election day situational visibility at the state level has always been a hindsight type of situation. There's been years in the past where we've been served lawsuits on election day before we even knew anything happened. In 2017, we didn't find out about some significant election day issues until the day after the election in the newspaper. We were basically situationally blinded, but that wasn't without reason because the obstructions in elections are actually baked into the system. In Idaho, we had operational challenges, psychological challenges, and geographic, geographical changes that all obstructed our visibility. Operationally, Idaho elections run neither a bottom up or a top down type of organization, but really more of a from the middle approach, meaning that the counties, not the state or the precincts, but the counties in the middle level actually run the election. And they're extremely busy on election day with a priority of communicating down to their precincts where the public are, but not necessarily up to the state where we run oversight for the entire operation. This lack of visibility leaves us underutilized and often leaves counties under resourced because their own pace, the challenges that they're facing, don't leave them excess bandwidth to reach up or out when help's needed. So they struggle forward on their own, often to their own demise. The operational problem, at least in Idaho, was compounded by a psychological one, one that was actually kind of hard for us to come to grips with early on. When the new Secretary of State took office, there was a 
seen as a big brother kind of a scenario. There was a big trust issue at hand. We were seen as there to come down hard on counties when they made mistakes with little to no interest in helping them do their work well. Uh, we had a hard time actually getting counties to believe that it was okay or even desired for them to tell us that they had a problem or had made an error or mistake. Solving that trust issue was something we didn't fully accomplish until likely this past November when they finally let us in to help with the COVID response. The third challenge in our situational environment is geographical. We have 44 counties spread out over 83,600 miles. We have wilderness, forests, mountains. Jurisdictions are up to eight to nine hours apart by car, which makes putting a state asset in every location almost impossible. Um, some areas are so remote they don't have cell lines or, or landlines that they can utilize at a polling location. And this makes communicating even basic details from the precinct endpoint to the county impractical, let alone all the way up to the state. And as a result, it's almost always the state that ends up staying in the dark. Bottom line here, if you have a complex or obstructed environment, you must devise a clear communication strategy to address these obstacles before the day of the event. If elections were the same today as they were 20 or 30 years ago, this wouldn't be a problem. But the landscape, the pace, and the challenges facing a modern election administrator or a policymaker at a state, local, or national level are morphing with every election cycle. Think about the change that's happened in the last four and a half years. As a result of cyber operations by nation state actors in 2016, elections were declared a component of US critical infrastructure in 2017 and joined the existing CI sectors under the Department of Homeland Security. That's why I'm able to be here with you today. 2016 revealed the complex cyber and informational tactics used by nations like Russia and China. 2018 would show involvement from Iran and other Eastern nation states, and 2020 would bring with it the possibility of domestic extremists getting involved as well. In a very short time, the elections landscape in both a cyber and physical sense became a huge and complicated attack surface. Now, most people see a day like November 3rd and think, well, it's just one election. But election administrators realize that it's actually a delicate choreography of over 9,000 individual jurisdictions nationwide, originating in 56 separate states and US territories, all expected by the public to go off without a single error or issue. Consider for a moment the details required to plan a wedding. Now imagine putting on 96 of them, all starting at exactly the same time, with 2,000 guests apiece. When you realize that every guest can only go to one and only one wedding, and it must be the right one because they're the only one on which they'll be on the guest list, you understand the complexity of operating an election. Now imagine hundreds of enemies trying to mess up that day and crash even one wedding because in the eyes of the public, it'll be like they impacted them all. In such a complex environment, learning not only how to communicate, but what to communicate, to whom, and when to do so, becomes increasingly important. This is where Harvard University enters our story. During Harvard's Defending Digital Democracy Project, or D3P, participants engage in and learn how to plan a tabletop training exercise. Now, this exercise was run mostly by a team of military officers on graduate assignments, and it used mock scenarios to demonstrate the need for clear game plans and lines of communication in the operations and elections environment. They ran us through the tools and techniques the military uses in these situations. And these tools became the starting point for a similar exercise that we ran in Idaho in early 2019. Now, in the year that followed, several Idaho counties were actually attacked by ransomware. So this incredibly helped bump up the reality of cyber threats on a month by month basis. And by January of 2020, when we ran the exercise again for a second time, participation nearly doubled. Now, typically, election offices are small and understaffed, and the problem is that the technology used in these elections today, from online voter registration systems to voter registration databases, absentee ballot request systems, they all require year-round cybersecurity support and monitoring. And this is one area where states can step in because these tools are typically run by the state for the benefit of the counties. Idaho used part of our 2018 and our 2020 HAVA funds to create a county cyber election cybersecurity subgrant and then visited all of Idaho's 44 counties from the smallest to the largest and did a security assessment with their leaders. Our goal here was twofold, to establish a common baseline of physical and cybersecurity standards, but also to address that trust issue that I mentioned earlier. We needed to be seen as there to help. So we found a way to add value to the equation. 
We brought knowledge and funding that they otherwise couldn't access. And then we offered expertise and support they weren't finding elsewhere. That brings me to point number two. You have to figure out how to add value to the situation. At nearly the same time, we received an invitation to participate in another D3P exercise. This, like the first, was run by a JSOC special operations operational officer. It specifically focused on the use of special operations command tools in elections incident response. The idea was to reinforce how a simple system established of established courses of action, documented SOPs, standard operating procedures, and critical incident reporting could inform election day decision making. It was called the Battle Staff Boot Camp. Four of us, including two county election officials, were able to take part in this event, and it was eye opening. Everyone could see how this would change the way we operated on election day. Counties could quickly centralize communications and get the help they needed. States wouldn't have to sit blind all day waiting for something to happen. Decision makers at different levels would know what needed to be solved and more importantly, what solutions they didn't need to come up with. The ideas were simple, but it was the synergy of the whole system that made it work. The theme we kept hearing was intelligence that we can gather will increase our situational awareness. And with situational awareness, we can update a common operating picture. Now, when I grasped that idea, I instantly knew we were doing three things wrong. One, we had little to no intel, or at least we didn't think we did. Secondly, we had almost zero situational awareness, and we knew we'd never created a common operating picture, let alone updated it. You see, we'd never considered thinking like the military, and yet we were facing the same type of problem-solving environment. It was high stakes and dynamic, and decisions had to be made quickly in variable, dense situations. So after this exercise, I needed to know more. It turns out that the dashboard tool that we used in the exercise, it was a mashup done by two former D3P students that were now software engineers. And I asked if we could license the idea and was told that it was simply built for the exercise with no admin tools or security. It was just basically a, a mock-up. I asked what the plans were to finish it and they said, well, there are none, but if you wanna build it, we'll give you the notes. So being a glutton for punishment, I said yes and brought it back home to Idaho. When I returned home and, and shared this screenshot from the battle staff exercise with Idaho's Director of Emergency Management, Director Brad Ritchie, who also I might add is an NPS graduate, Brad walked me downstairs to meet his GIS officer. We immediately knew that the tool that they had could become the base for the perfect pilot test, something that with minor modifications could be made to work like the tool we used in battle staff boot camp and power a test dashboard for November 2020. It's in that moment that Idaho's Edison was born. Now, Thomas Edison in 1876 borrowed on the ideas of those who came before him and gave the world the first commercially viable light bulb. And in the same manner, Idaho was now setting out to borrow from the lessons learned from US special operations techniques to build a tool to illuminate the elections process for administrators. The Election Day Intelligence and Situational Awareness Network or Edison for short, granted we spelled it wrong, would need to create a digital common operating picture of the elections landscape, provide data that could be filtered and sorted and give different levels of administrators the information they needed to make decisions with no more and no less information than what was needed for the moment. For our pilot plan, we would look at only a handful of data inputs already accessible to the Office of Emergency Management. They were already following utilities like power and gas and internet. They already got reports from traffic and EMS and first responders. And then we'd overlay that with our GIS locations of all of Idaho's 930 or more polling locations. Now, even in its infancy, this proved to be a huge success. Remember the scenario we began with? That was our senior cyber analyst sitting in front of Edison on November 3rd, 2020. Edison was tracking information from local fire departments, utilities, dispatches, ISPs, all the information from OEM. It was being fed intel from Idaho's Fusion Center and from CISA, and that was the bulletin that came in at 10, 15 hours. Somewhere in the Eastern United States, a state had reported robocalls urging people to, quote, stay safe, stay home, as if the election had been canceled. CISA immediately shared the intel and Idaho picked it up in our war room. It was posted to Edison and the team began searching social media for evidence of the calls in Idaho. The 1020 alert came from the gas company. It was the report of a possible gas leak, but they had no idea that there was an open polling location 
only a half a mile away. Because of that bulletin, uh, the emergency management chief was able to insert himself into the conversation and work with fire and PD to secure an alternate traffic pattern that didn't require moving our polling location. Everyone involved in the decision had the elections location as a factor early on simply because of the information in Edison. As a bonus, the county clerk, he got his call from our team alerting him to the situation and allowing him to engage nine minutes before he was notified of the incident in any other manner. And yes, eventually the robocalls did also come to Idaho, but because of the advance notice provided, we already had the press release drafted and we took to Twitter mere seconds after the first detected mention of Idaho calls on social media. Bottom line three, ask for help to consider the intelligence that you're already overlooking because it's probably there. I'll give you one more example. Some of the successes we saw on election day were almost expected and others were a surprise. A result of having a different perspective and being alert to seeing things with new eyes. Poll books are probably our best example. When we first started discussing Edison, one of the questions was how would we put the tool at the endpoint in the polling location? We wanted to know if we could use a smartphone, maybe a computer, but we never really considered multitasking electronic poll books because the November 2020 election was the first in Idaho where electronic poll books were actually extensively used. 22 of our 44 counties had just bought them with the grant funds we provided, and this covered almost 80% of our population because the six largest counties were on board. What we didn't expect, however, was that once they were all turned on, we had this amazing new visibility to the endpoints. I mean, of course, that sounds logical now, but we simply hadn't thought about it. This brings us to where we go from here. Edison was such a success in November that we've pushed it forward to the next iteration. This is the game plan for Edison version two. Development of Edison will fall to the students and professors of the newly created Idaho Elections Cybersecurity Center at Boise State University, where our office is sponsoring R&D on not only Edison, but also on election auditing practices, the viability of securing votes with blockchain and other election related computer science challenges. Boise State will also be incorporating a browser based form of the incident reporting deployed on either the poll book or smartphone. The form will include incident categories, critical criticality levels and impact ratings, all to assist in triaging responses at the county and state level more efficiently. And best of all, through our partnership with the computer science department at Boise State, we'll be building this solution from scratch in open source code so it can be shared with other states in the years to come. We truly believe it'll be a game changer in the election space and change situational awareness on election day. And this brings us to our final point. When you discover a force multiplier, get it into the field. None of this would have been possible without the sharing of the decision-making tools and the models used by officers and operators in the United States Special Operations community. To those soldiers, we say thank you for sharing your experience and leadership. I hope that our time today has inspired you, participants here at APEX, to consider how these ideas can apply in your sector of the Homeland Security Enterprise and can equip you to fulfill your specific mission. With that, thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Absolutely, thank you for the question. Uh, what you're looking at on the right-hand side here is a trailer that is utilized in two manners in, in Ada County, our largest and most populous county. It was originally devised to help put early voting locations out at some of the more hard to reach areas of the county, but it was also realized by doing that that it became the perfect countermeasure to a, an electrical outage or a shutdown or some kind of scenario that, that closes a polling location because within minutes, an entire team of operators, uh, elections administrators can jump in a truck. Uh, it's hooked up to this trailer at a central location in the county and they can deploy within minutes. Um, when this situation was happening, they were actually warming up the truck and getting ready to roll out in the mobile voting location to put it into another location uh, in the same precinct area. Now, the nice thing about Edison is when they put a emergency loop on uh, the map for us, it would tell us exactly how far we'd have to park this trailer away to be able to relocate that outside of the danger zone of the gas leak. So that was the specific thing. Yes, very much uh, devised in advance and uh, part of the contingency plan that we talk about. 
The photo that you see to the left is the war room uh, that we had in the basement of the Capitol in one of the conference rooms down there. Um, that was our team on elections day. We had folks from the utilities in there. We had our own IT team, some of our communications vendors, et cetera. That is one of the biggest things that right now Boise State University is working on. I think it was Bill was the name of the gentleman that asked the question. Um, they will be setting up secure authenticated logins. They'll be encrypting information both directions in transit, utilizing every standard operating uh, cybersecurity, some of the cybersecurity basics, I guess you could say. Um, we are looking long term at actually creating isolated and dedicated dark fiber lines throughout the state that the state would have uh, priority access to on election day. So we've actually taken it down to a point of looking at potentially having an entire proprietary network underneath it for not only communications through Edison, but also the other information that's traveling back and forth. We're with the poll books, we use the same type of, of uh, encrypted at rest, encrypted in transit. Uh, security to make sure that the Delta files moving back and forth on those poll books to the central location are also uh, protected that way. They operate to proxy servers instead of direct to the main database and then transfer information back and forth that way as well. So several different layers of security there. So it, it definitely varies by polling location. We have some polling locations that are so remote, they actually, uh, we've considered the use of satellite phones and there's seven locations in the state that we have to come up with. Uh, if, we, if we take the PACE uh, communications plan approach, primary uh, going down through with uh, um, blanking on the, the PACE acronym right now, but I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, in a lot of locations, we only get one or two primary and alternate. Uh, we don't have that contingency or emergency level in the PACE plan. So there's the PACE. Um, but in many cases, it's going to be primarily a cellular line, secondarily communications to a landline or through an internet connection. The actual tabulation equipment, the voting equipment itself is isolated away from any kind of internet connection by Idaho statute, but our communications can certainly leverage everything that we can get our hands on. I'm not familiar with SHSP security funds um, by, the, by the terminology. We used a significant amount of HAVA, Help America Vote Act grant funds. Uh, we will be looking as we, as we continue forward, looking at it with the Office of Emergency Management. There may be funds over there on that side that you're referring to, um, but I'd have to get into a discussion with our emergency managers and, and that team to better be able to answer your question. You're welcome to certainly reach out to me by email to continue that conversation. So just to be clear, uh, it was through the Harvard D3P project and officers that were actually in school at Harvard that we were able to gain a large amount of this information. Um, you can pick up some of that information through the Belfer Center at Harvard University. It's called the Defending Digital Democracy Project. The Battlestaff Bootcamp Playbook is something that's actually available to the public now. Uh, and that's where a lot of it originated. Uh, specifically, it was Major Kate Conley, who was the JSOC operations officer that led those exercises that has been the wealth of information for us. I think the first one, the biggest thing that we saw is you don't realize the amount of information you're overlooking that would be helpful in your environment um, that's already there. You just have to see what other partners you have out there. And like I said, 70% of the things that we actually needed were already existing in our Idaho Office of Emergency Management. We just didn't realize they were utilizing this emergency dashboard type of approach to already kind of consolidate their information. And we were able to bring that in and use that for our test. Now, when we move over to Edison, which we intend to be both open source and, and fully available to other states, and that's why we did it that way, they're going to be feeding us that information from their GIS system. So we'll get information from EMS, et cetera, all through that partnership that was already there. We didn't have to go out and find access to all that information. I think that the second thing is get all of your stakeholders involved early on and get that line of communication open. It was 
hard for us to discover that we had a trust issue and that we had a perception that we were just seen as this big brother kind of, of figurehead at the top of the, of the pyramid when they actually didn't want us getting involved in things. Uh, we had to figure out a way to get that line of communication open, get in there. It literally took us traveling around to all 44 counties and visiting these individuals one-on-one, -on -one, seeing how we could help, seeing what challenges they were facing, and then looking at that as a much more holistic uh, situation to try and come up with a solution. So I think those two things, get that line of communication open early, um, really engage with your, with your stakeholders to get that there, and then look for the information. It's hard to say look for the information you don't know you don't know, but ask for others to see, you know, when you share what you do and what you're facing, they may have resources that can help you uh, solve your problems.